part of Egypt, of course, is the Nile Valley. It's represented by that dark, thick line going through uh, the landscape. Uh, the Nile River made life possible. Uh, and it was central to Egyptian life, especially because of its annual flooding. Um, it's so important that for the Egyptians, they didn't even have a name for it. They just called it the river. Um, it's only later that it gets named from, from the Greeks, uh, the Nilos. And so every year, melting snows and monsoon rains in Central Africa uh, feed into the Nile in a massive way, and they expand the river. And the rising waters reach Egypt in June, and they, and they peak around late July to early September, it changes. And then eventually they start to recede. And what they leave behind are a, is a layer of rich, fertile soil. Um, and this was essential for agriculture in Egypt. This was essential to their life. Um, in a good year, you could have a good crop, good yield, uh, and you have a surplus. In a bad year, if the floods were low, you know, famine. Um, also, sometimes the floods could be far too high, and then you have catastrophe, destruction. Um, and here's just a picture of this process. It was still going on until the early 20th century. Now, of course, modern Egypt has dams to control uh, water levels uh, much more mechanically, but the flood, the natural flood, was still happening um, in the early 20th century. So the Nile, though, is important not just for agriculture and farming. It creates an entire ecosystem that the Egyptians were dependent on. This includes birds and fish, plants, which were the natural core resources, reeds, papyrus, uh, used for manufacturing goods. Um, the, the silt it's, it's itself, this brittle mud, uh, it's good for agriculture, but it's good for other stuff, too, like building. Mud brick was the fundamental material they used for building. Um, not stone, as you might as you might think. They definitely used some stone, but mud brick was much, far more common. And of course, the Nile is crucial for transportation, uh, for trade, for communication. Um, boats were the way you got around. Um, major temple villages were situated near the Nile, and they'd be connected by canals. So, boat was definitely the way. The, way. Uh, the Nile also has dangers. Right? Uh, crocodiles, hippos, and of course, always the risk of drowning. In places, it's very wide and very deep. So in terms of the implications for mythology, this whole landscape, uh, you know, the welfare of Egypt depended on the phenomenon of flooding. So the Nile flooding and its whole ecosystem are central to Egyptian thought. Uh, and it's impossible for the Egyptians to conceive of a world without a river running through the middle of it. Uh, water is central to the perceptions of the cosmos and the way they conceptualize different realms. Uh, so one way to think about it is if you know anything about Greek myth, you know that in the Greek mythological world, the sun moves across the sky in a chariot. But for the Egyptians, you can probably guess how it moves across the sky, in a boat. Um, so the world around them affects the way that they try to visualize it and, and conceive of it metaphorically. The um, Nile Valley is, is important, of course, but that doesn't mean the deserts aren't also important. They are. They held valuable resources, minerals, stones, uh, all the fine stones maybe you know about that the Egyptians built with, uh, gold, and so forth. But it was also a place of danger uh, as well. Um, heat exhaustion, sandstorms, thirst, flash floods, um, Sand with the desert always encroaching onto the uh, irrigated plains, into the canals. Uh, there's animals and scavengers out there as well, and it's believed to be a place of exotic monsters and creatures. Uh, both good ones and bad ones, but a lot of bad ones. And this plays a role in mythology uh, as well. Okay, so if that's the where, what about the when? Don't worry, you don't need to know all these dates. But I put them up here for one reason. Is I wanted to uh, emphasize the longevity of the time we're talking about, right? So kind of our earliest understanding of Egyptian history when the kings first emerge is somewhere around 3200 BC. Of course, the prehistory goes back long before that, but that's when at least we have a record, a written record of the first kings. Um, and ancient Egypt, uh, at least ancient Egyptian belief systems, until it gets completely supplanted by Christianity, goes all the way until uh, the early first millennium AD. 
uh, the first few centuries after the birth of Christ. And that's when uh, Christianity gradually supplants the old traditional belief systems. So that's over 3,000 years. That's a huge time span. Um, and that's part of why it's so difficult to study Egyptian mythology, because the texts are, are very disparate in date, uh, traditions change, and we're also talking about quite a large distance as well, with many different villages and cities with their own traditions. So there's a lot of variety uh, over time and space in, um, in the belief systems, in the ideas about the gods. Um, but also, another challenge for studying Egyptian mythology is that uh, they just didn't really have a narrative written tradition comparable to, say, the Greeks. So, I mean, how many of you are familiar with Hesiod and Homer? Um, a few. So, you know, the, the Egyptians didn't have something equivalent to that. Um, that means that we have to, to figure out the, well, how Egyptians thought about the gods and thought about uh, the creation and all of these, these uh, topics. We have to pluck them from sources all over the place. And there is no fixed canon thus of gods or beliefs, no one codified national myth. Um, instead, there is different mythological traditions and beliefs. You know, they existed co they coexisted side by side. Uh, they, you know, they, they didn't necessarily agree, but they weren't necessarily contradictory either. And we'll see a little bit of that as we go through. Um, so here is just um, an example of some of the sources that we have for Egyptian mythology. And I will be trying to give you some quotations from these sources <laughs> so you can get a sense of the texts. And they're quite different in, in nature, and they're very spread out over time. Uh, there's a lot more, and I'm not going to go into detail, but I just wanted to highlight the ones that I'm going to make reference to. So some of the earliest texts that we have are the pyramid texts. And these were religious texts, funerary texts, really, that were written, um, that they were carved into the pyramids of some of the kings at the end of the Old Kingdom in the early First Intermediate Period, uh, Dynasty 5, Dynasty 6. Not the great pyramids that you might be familiar with. Those did not have pyramid texts written in them, although they probably had them on scrolls um, included with the burial. But by Dynasty 5 and 6, they decided to carve them in the pyramids themselves. And these are a series of spells for the transfiguration of the king to ensure his survival into the afterlife. Um, and within there, there's allusions to myths, there's hints. We get glimpses of how the Egyptians conceived of the role of the gods in the cosmos uh, and, and these other realms. <coughs> now, initially, these types of texts seem to be reserved for royalty, but as time went on, sorry? Uh, where, are the, where are all the pyramids with, uh, with those? Um... Same general region, but not in Giza, but in that further down the road. A little bit further down, yeah. Exactly. Um, yeah, most of, almost all the pyramids in that period are in the northern part of Egypt, <laughs> like around Memphis and kind of that area. So several centuries after this, in the Middle Kingdom, uh, these texts, these sacred texts and spells, we start seeing them pop up in the burials. Of, uh, of not just the royalty, but of the elite generally. And they, or they show up especially carved in coffins. <coughs> and that's why they call them the coffin texts. But again, they are a series of spells, all about transfiguration of the soul into the afterlife. And they make allusions to mythological um, mythical events. Um, and they mention deities, and they even mention events about, around the creation. Um, we have about 1,200 of those um, in total. We have other sources as well, I and mean, we do get literary narrative texts. They're not very long, but we're going to look at a couple of them tomorrow. Um, and these are stories um, involving the gods, uh, involving theology, and, and so forth. Uh, we're going to look at the Book of the Heavenly Cow, and we're also going to look at the story of, the, of Isis in the name of Ra, which is actually a spell for healing. And uh, what we'll see is that a lot of these spells for healing, they'll have a mythological story attached to them. This one in particular is about how to heal a scorpion sting, um, for example. Uh, and then we have other almost the, or tales or works that are almost epic in their um, construction, such as the contending of Horus and stuff. So those are helpful too. Those usually come, those are a bit later than the other sources I mentioned. Um, now, how many of you have heard about Isis and Osiris? 
Yeah, right. So if you've read the stories about Isis and Osiris, then whatever you read was probably almost certainly derived in some form from this guy, Plutarch. So once Egypt is taken over by Greek rulers and later on the Roman Empire, um, and even a little bit before that, you have the, oh, swarms of Greek intellectuals and, and, and curious Greek travelers who come to Egypt who are fascinated by its ancient culture and its beliefs. Um, and they write about um, Egyptian religion. And then especially once Egypt is taken over by Greek rulers and becomes more connected to the Mediterranean, certain gods like Isis and Osiris start to have a following outside of Egypt and become very popular. And uh, as a result, there is, uh, there's an interest in talking about their history, their mythology, their stories. And the Greeks and the Romans are especially interested in this type of narrative mythology. And so it's, uh, it's to them that we get stories of Isis and Osiris. Um, these, of course, are they're certainly based on Egyptian, original Egyptian sources, but naturally, as the Greeks and Romans appropriate Isis and Osiris, they give them their own character as well. Um, so we start to get a blend of different traditions in there. But certainly, the Greek and Roman sources are um, important for us in reconstructing the mythological history of gods such as Isis and Osiris. Excuse me, when did the Greeks get involved in Egypt? So, um, when they conquered Egypt, that's Alexander the Great, and that happens uh, around 330 BC. That's when their first influence was... Uh, that's when they conquer it, but they're there before that. So there's colonies maybe going back as early as the 6th century. Um, there's definitely a Greek presence in Egypt for trading. And Herodotus, who wrote in the 5th century, also um, claims to have visited Egypt and writes extensively about so the, Egypt. The influence is extensive as well. Was way back uh, to the fifth century. The, uh, the evidence of e or sorry, the influence of Egypt on Greece. No, Greece on e e oh no, 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 no. There's very little um, influence of Greece on Egypt before Alexander, okay. um, but there is quite a lot of influence from Egypt to Greece, uh, uh, such as in areas of like you know uh, sculpture, for example. And um, and the Greeks attribute to the Egyptians uh, you know a lot of knowledge and science uh, as well. Um, okay. So I'm going to get to the creation soon, but uh, just a little bit about the gods in general, again, for those who may be not um, so familiar, especially because it's quite confusing, right? Um, uh, so first of all, uh, you know, there are some basic questions, right? Who are the gods? What do they represent? Uh, how many are there? Uh, where are they? And, and so forth. So in terms of the gods, basically Egyptians saw divinity and the supernatural at work everywhere, right? Uh, in all natural and all human phenomena, uh, they saw behind that some sort of supernatural force. So they used the gods, basically, to make the abstract aspects of the world more concrete, to make them easier to grasp conceptually. Um, they are not alone, of course, right? Most societies have done this to a certain extent. Uh, in terms of who they are, and what they represent, they are possessors of power. Um, you could pray to them about anything, you could ask for their help, uh, you can interact with them. Um, one way to put it is that they are imminent in nature, they're all around. Um, and some gods are associated with particular parts of the universe, as we'll see Atom, um, Geb, Nut, Shu, we're gonna see them all in more, more detail in a moment. Um, Ra, of course, the sun. Uh, oftentimes, the gods are associated with specific places, or towns, or mountains. Um, and then other gods are associated with uh, specific abstract concepts, right? the personification of those concepts. So Seth, chaos, Maat, order and harmony, uh, Ta, creativity, uh, Thoth, intelligence, uh, Sekhmet, rage, Hathor, love, um, uh, and, and so on. Oh, and an important one, Horus, kingship, uh, dominion. Basically, Horus is the uh, authority of kingship, the divine, um, the divine power of kingship. Uh, so the king upon accession is identified with Horus. So in that respect, the king himself is not a god, but the power of kingship is divine. So once uh, a person becomes king, that's why they seem kind of somewhat semi-divine because they have. Um, that power with them until they die, of course. So gods are complicated beings in Egypt. They can have personalities, 
They can have failings, as we'll see with those tigers. They can die, although often they can come back to life. Um, so that's convenient. Um, but they're subject to the negative forces of the world, just like people. Um, in terms of how many gods, well, there's a couple of ways to answer that. The thousands, potentially, um, if you count all of the different manifestations of the different gods, the different variations in different places, local gods, lesser spirits that inhabit everything, um, the star gods, they have deified kings um, who go to the afterlife and become um, gods as well, uh, monsters, and so forth. There's a lot. But uh, really, though, there's about 80 or so that had actual shrines and temples that people worshipped. Um, and about 30 of these are major or national. Uh, and, but I should point out that some of the gods that are prominent in myth and the creation, for example, uh, are not really worshipped. So like Shu or Geb, right? there aren't temples to them, um, but they still play an important role now in mythology. Um, but let's move on then to uh, the creation itself, so we have enough time. Um, so the origins of the universe, this was an intellectual problem that the Egyptians were fascinated with, like many people. Uh, where did we come from? Where did the world come from? Where did the gods come from? Uh, and there's kind of two different aspects, right? There's cosmology. Uh, the nature of the cosmos and cosmogony, the creation of the div divine, or, you know, the emergence of the divine. And in terms of the basic timeline of, uh, of the creation of the world, we've broken down into kind of four phases. Um, first, there's the creation of the world and everything in it, uh, the cosmos, you know, um, I don't want to say the planet, because I didn't really conceive of it that way, but there's, there's Egypt and there's cosmos, right, so and everything in it. Um, and then after that, after the creation, you have the rule by Ra, who rules for an ambiguous amount of time, but a while. Uh, and he rules over everything. Eventually, as we see, he gets tired of it, gets fed up, and he leaves. Uh, he goes up into the, the, the nether regions, the other world, the areas, he goes to the beyond. Uh, and he leaves the world in charge, uh, under the charge of other gods. Um, uh, his children, and at this time, this also includes then um, the conflict. Sorry, the writing's a little. I should have corrected that. Including the conflict between Osiris and um, and Seth, uh, and then Seth and Horus, uh, what's commonly called the Osiris cycle. That all happens in this period. Uh, eventually, that is resolved. Uh, Horus, of course, becomes the king, um, and then it gets. There's different traditions, and it's a little murky after that. But uh, there may be more after that. Uh, other um, other divine spirits ruling. Uh, but then eventually, it's followed by the rule by kings. And then we get into what the Egyptians consider the historical period, a um, period where they have records. Uh, so the stories and beliefs surrounding the series of events serves not only to explain how we got here uh, and where the world comes from, but also the origins of divinity. Um, and especially, it serves as an explanation and justification for the institution of kingship. Egypt's kings are direct heirs of the gods. Um, this is where they get their authority from. And this is how the institution gets its legitimacy. Uh, the kings of Egypt, pharaohs as we often call them, they are just uh, extensions, right? They're continuing uh, rule on behalf of the gods who have better things to do. Elsewhere. Um, okay, so what we're going to do then today, as I as mentioned, is we're going to talk about the creation of the world and its habit, its inhabitants. Tomorrow, we're going to uh, look at the rule of Ra and some of the mythological stories associated with that. And then Friday, we'll do the Osiris cycle. Um, okay, so. Before, in terms of mythology, but especially for the creation, there's no single text that lays it all out. Instead, beliefs about the cosmos and the origins of the universe are sprinkled throughout 
hymns, prayers, funerary texts, spells for the deceased, um, and so on. And also, there are different perspectives that emerge about the nature of the cosmos and where it came from. Um, and so we're going to look at two traditions that are fairly dominant in our, in our sources. Uh, the first, and probably the most prominent, is the Heliopolitan tradition. And this comes from the center of the city called Heliopolis. And as you can maybe guess from its name, uh, the principal god there is the sun god. Uh, and this is this tradition, it's um, the best known to us, and it's the one, if you write about Egyptian mythology, you probably write about this one. Uh, it's focused on a group of gods called the Aeneid, uh, nine deities, and at the top of them is the creator god, Atum. Um, now, there's a second tradition um, also uh, that I think is uh, it's, it's, it's somewhat prominent and also I think fairly interesting. We'll talk about it a little bit, hopefully today, if we have time. And it's called the Memphite theology. Uh, now, it is centered at the city of Memphis. Now, Memphis was a very powerful political center uh, for much of Egypt's history. Not all of it, but for a lot of it. And its patron god was the god Ptah. So naturally, the priests of Memphis wanted their god to be at the center of the creation, right? Um, and so the stories that they developed focus around Ptah as the creator god. And it's a good example of how politics and religion definitely interacted in Egypt. Uh, because religious beliefs and practices are so pervasive, uh, you know, that religion is power. Uh, anyways, but we'll get to that in a little bit later. So, let's start with the Heliopolitan tradition. Um, so in the beginning, in the pre-existence, the pre-creation, uh, the way the Egyptians visualized it is chaos, more or less. Um, there is a dark water, watery domain, completely unlimited, um, referred to as none. And Within none contained all the potential for life. Um, now, in some traditions, in some variations, uh, within um, none, there are elements and qualities of chaos that become personified as deities uh, in their own respect. Um, in other traditions, it's just one watery kind of abyss, if you will. Now, the creation is kind of imagined uh, for the Egyptians in this tradition as a process of differentiation. All right, so there's one source one original source, which gradually is differentiated into the diverse elements that make up the world. And so what happens is the creator God emerges out of none uh, in this sort of primal event, uh, and then initially floats in a formless state. Uh, but eventually, he's going to differentiate himself. Now, it's not exactly clear so how he does this. Uh, but so the Egyptians represented it metaphorically in a number of ways. Uh, one particular popular way it's represented is as a primeval mound, the Ben Ben Mound. Um, this is a mound in, uh, that has symbolic value because it resembles or it's inspired by the mounds of land that recede, or I shouldn't say recede, but that appear uh, when the Nile flood recedes, right? So the annual flood, the water also comes in, and then it starts to recede, and the highest points emerge first, and this is, you know, these are very fertile areas, and they start growing things, and you plant them. So they're associated with fertility and life and so forth. So much like that, then, it's, there's this idea that the creation, the creator god first uh, appears um, in the form of or on top of this primeval um, mount. And for the Heliopolitan tradition, this mount is identified with a raised area within the temple, the sacred precinct itself. And in fact, a lot of temples in Egypt, the very, the, the most inner uh, sacred section of the temple would be raised above the rest of the temple to represent uh, this primeval mount. That's one way. But there are other ways, too. Uh, sometimes uh, the emergence of the creator is represented as a blue lotus flower rising above the surface. Um, and then sometimes with a naked child uh, in the middle uh, to represent the birth of the creator god of the sun god. Uh, another, another version uh, has it uh, described as, as the creator god um, emerging and coming into existence within an egg. 
I should probably be somewhat self-explanatory, right, in this pre-born state. Um, so there, there's lots of different ways that they conceptualized it. But the creator emerges out of this initial chaos, is this, this, and this primordial water. So in this process, in the texts, we actually encounter two names, two manifestations of the creator God. Atom and Capri. And they're considered complementary. Uh, so Capri uh, is the one coming into existence. Uh, and it comes from the Egyptian word Kepher, which means to become. Uh, and it's often, and Capri is often visualized as the rising sun, the sun at dawn, um, just coming into the world. Uh, and then Atom is kind of a counter to this. He's the one who has come into existence. Uh, existence completed, right? Uh, having come, having finished this process, and so we'll see then um, both names together, and we'll see different versions of the Creator God, especially when he's represented as the Sun God, as either Capri um, and in the form of a beetle, I should point out, because the word Kepper uh, was spelled in Egyptian through the beetle. Um, that was the hieroglyph for Kepper to become, to come into existence. Um, so we see you know, different representations of the greater God in, in this respect. And we'll come back to this more when we talk about the Son of God and Ra tomorrow. Um, and so uh, here's an example of one of the texts that talks about the, the creation. Uh, it describes it as I just suggested. When you become high, is that the high ground? When you rose as the bad man in the Phoenix enclosure in Heliopolis. So you can tell this is the Heliopolitan version. The creation happens there. Now, Atom is the source of everything else. And we're told um, in some other texts that he becomes lonely. Uh, it's just him and the primordial waters. So uh, he, to change this, to rectify the situation, he differentiates himself. Uh, in more simple terms, he creates offspring. How does he do this? Well, Atom is described more or less as androgynous. And in many versions, the way that it happens is that he said to have masturbated and then impregnates himself by swallowing the semen and then sneezes and spits out his, two, his first few children. Um, and if you're thinking, well, there's a lot of fluids going on, yes, we'll come back to that. Um, it's very physical. Uh, and um, we'll come back to that in a little while. Um, why sneezing and spitting? Well, because these first two gods, Shu and Tefnut, uh, they're homonyms for the verbs to sneeze and to spit. Um, so there seems to be a connection, connection there. So he creates his first two offspring and he embraces them and he gives them uh, part of his life force, his ka. Right? And this is the term the Egyptians used to describe that part of the soul, which is the life force. Um, uh, and it's you know the thing that gives you that animates uh, all living things. <clears throat> and so Shu is uh, typically portrayed as atmosphere uh, or air, and Tefna, Tefnut is is basically his female counterpart. Sometimes she's understood as moist air because she is dry air, but really they're there as a pair in order to ensure succeeding generations. Um, and they, they're also as a pair for another reason, but I'll come to that um, in a moment. Anyhow, Shu and Tefnut are born, and they separate from the Creator. Um, and then they get together, and they also have children, and they give birth to two further gods, Geb, the earth, and Nut, the sky. Now, we're told that Geb and Nut were so close and so attached that there was no room between them for anything else to exist. Um, New conceived for the children, new gods, but she either couldn't or wouldn't give birth to them because she and Geb were so intertwined. Um, they wanted to be one, they didn't want to be separate. Um, and thus, there's this first crisis of the creation in that they seem to be reversing the process, right? Because the creation is a process of diversification and differentiation. Um, so, uh, Shu steps in to save the day and he, and he separates his children, Geb and Newt, and he creates a space between the earth. Uh, and the sky vault. Uh, thus, it creates an inhabitable void in which all the creatures could breathe the air that gives life and they can exist. 
And so with that act, we now have the basic elements of the physical world. Um, and this is one of the most common aspects of the creation that illustrated in Egyptian texts and art. Um, nudes there as a sky vault, and if you've ever been, how many of you have been to Egypt, actually? A couple of you. So if you've been in any of the New Kingdom tombs, um, you may have seen, or even in some of the temples, and maybe you saw at the, on the top, you might have seen nudes, right, across the sky. Um, and so it's very commonly represented in the arts um, of both funerary art and, and uh, temple art. Um, so, we now have the physical world. Um, but there's more, it's more than just the physical world. Um, let's look at this text um, from one of the common texts. Uh, it starts out, oh, you ate infinite ones and an infinite number of infinite ones. Well, who, who are those? Uh, notice that she has some helpers. Um, it's a bit of a task holding up the sky. Um, so he seemed to create a bunch of um, sub-divinities, divinities, if you will, to help him, these, these infinite ones. Um, they're initially, they say there's eight, but then, again, it's one of those um, murky, uh, malleable aspects. Uh, but then there's also many of them. And, uh, and the text goes on, so it describes the physical world, right? You encircle the sky with your arms, you draw together the sky and horizon again. She was giving you birth out of the flood, out of waters, out of chaos, out of darkness. Now, he might allot you to gather newt. But now we get to something else. While Shu is eternal recurrence and Tefnu is eternal sameness. Then said Atum, my living daughter is Tafnut. She will exist with her, sorry, brother, Shu. Uh, life is his identity. Order, in Egyptian Maat, is her identity. So what's going on here? Um, well, Tafnut isn't just the consort of Shu. Um, she's also, uh, she's a kind of complementary opposite. And she doesn't just represent a physical aspect of the world. She represents a more abstract aspect. She is identified with order and spaces. So Ma'at, which I've translated here as order, is a really important philosophical concept to the Egyptians. It governs all aspects of their worldview. Um, and it's best understood as the correct cosmic order. Uh, it combines all aspects of daily behavior, what we might call morality or moral behavior, um, and connects that with correct cosmic order and harmony. Uh, and what about the sameness, eternal sameness? Uh, this order is unchanging, it's eternal, it's permanent. Uh, it's a little bit like the laws of nature. Uh, that's kind of what he's getting at there. Um, you know, it can't be changed. The sun always rises and sets. The Nile always floods through Egypt. The king always rules over men. Uh, these are just unchanging aspects of the universe. Uh, so it's, it's similar to our concept of natural law in contemporary Western thoughts. But at the same time, of course, the world does change, right? Uh, mostly on a, from the Egyptian point of view, on a cyclical basis. And so Shu represents that. Uh, Shu represents the cyclical dynamism within this order. The sun rises and then it sets. The Nile floods, but then it recedes. Humans are born, grow old, and then die. And so the, these two parts, life, and order are made parallel, they're made twins. They're tied together and they come into existence together. So this version of the creation isn't just about explaining how the earth, physically, the elements, the people all came to begin into being. It's also about how the principles of existence and how the world works today connect. Um, uh, so this is, and this is a very important part of it. It's not just physical creation, it's also the kind of intellectual perception of the creation. But we're not done yet. So from uh, Gavin Newt, we have uh, four more gods. And then we have the whole uh, Indian complete, as it's called. Um, and these four gods, again, should be probably familiar to you. You have Isis and Osiris, who are a pair. And then Seth and Nephthys, who are also a pair. Uh, but with the plurality of children now, four children, comes the introduction of conflict. Uh, Osiris and Isis, the harmonious couple, uh, represent a world governed by order. Seth and Nephthys uh, represent, to a certain extent, disorder. 
Although we'll see on Friday how and later on in that phase roles kind of changes and she becomes an ally of ISIS. But for now, she's with Seth. Um, now Seth is aggressive. Uh, he represents virility, masculinity, but a damaging virility and an ineffective virility. And Nafis thus represents infertility. She can serve as a wet nurse, but she can't give birth. So they, you know, they represent the two different aspects, these two op opposing aspects of life. Um, one that's more orderly and one that represents you know, the lack of ma, the lack of order. So you know, to this point, the creation of the world is a story about diversity evolving from a single source. Uh, you've got, you know, we start with all-encompassing unity, the, you know, the primordial um, waters, uh, and then you have the duality of Shu and Tafnut. Uh, you have an attempt to return back to singularity and unity, uh, but now we have plurality. And you know, the giving birth is just a metaphor of explaining how the different elements of nature came from a single physical source, uh, deriving substance from you know, their originator, from their parent. Now, what about humanity then? When do we get to them? Um, well, different traditions put the creation of humanity at different points. Sometimes almost immediately right after the gods, sometimes a little later. But interestingly, the creation of humanity doesn't get a lot of attention in the sources. Not nearly as much as the creation of the universe and the gods. Uh, the Egyptians just didn't really seem to care as much about that. Um, it's, it's often just kind of mentioned in passing. Um, but when it is mentioned, it's often uh, expressed in terms of, of, of tears. Uh, so um, here's one example from a coffin text. Uh, the All Lord, which is another term for um, the Creator God. I, you notice it's a very neutral term, right? So this text will work for different cities. If the city wants to make their God the Creator God. Um, polytheism is infinitely flexible, right? Uh, so, and the All Lord said, I've created the gods from my sweat and the people from the tears of my eye. Um, the reasons for the tears differ in different versions, sometimes from loneliness, uh, sometimes out of anger. Um, and it, the origins of that, or where it's probably coming from, is again a, a linguistic one. The word for tears and the word for people are homonyms in the Egyptian language. So that's probably where that originates from. There's another version, though, that incorporates a different god, uh, the god Kanum, who is uh, a craftsman god, um, one who manufactures things, and it's connected, and then it connects the creation of humans to the Nile silt. Um, canoe is also a, a potter par excellence, and so we get some images occasionally of canoe fashioning people physically from the Nile silt. This, uh, sorry that this illustration is so terrible, but it's a drawing uh, from the temple of Hatshepsut, and it shows that uh, canoe creating hot shot suit on his potter's wheel. Um, okay, so, um, sorry, it's almost out of time. So I think actually, just to review a little bit, and then I'm gonna, I'll pause and I'll stop after this slide. Uh, in terms of the instruments and means of creation, uh, as we saw earlier, the, the, the version I've told you so far is very, physical, right? It involves sexual acts, masturbation, tears, spitting, uh, sneezing. Um, and that seems to be very characteristic of the Heliopolitan tradition. But uh, not all traditions are focused on a kind of physical um, creation. Others uh, focus more on the intellectual, uh, especially the Memphite theology. And, and then we have these other personified um, intellectual concepts that are involved in the process of creation. So Hekka, magic, uh, it's this special power that the gods can really harness. And you as a human can harness it too if you do the right spells and you get the gods on your side. Uh, also Sia, perception or creative knowledge. Um, and as well as that, who, the authoritative word. Uh, and that especially comes out in, in the Memphite tradition. And these concepts, uh, they get somewhat integrated into the Heliopolitan tradition as well, but they, they definitely stick around, and uh, they continue to be employed in Egyptian uh, ideas about religion and the afterlife as well. 
So for example, uh, in stories about the sun god and his daily cycle, uh, again, if you've been to the Valley of the Kings and been to some of the tombs, and you'll have seen some of the um, underworld books which describe the journey of, of the sun god and his cyclical journey, right? To go under uh, to the underworld, it's a dangerous place, and come through the other side. And a lot of times, he is accompanied uh, by Sia, you know, creative knowledge uh, and perception, and as well as an, an Heka, this magic power. Um, and so you know, the, the creation, in, in many respects, is happening, it happens at the beginning once in a single event, but then it's happening continually, every day. Every day the sun rises, and then it sets. And then it all happens again, and the sun is reborn. Um, so it's, you know, it's both at the same time once, and then eternal. Um, OK, so I will, I'm going to stop there, and then we will pick up with the Memphite fight theology tomorrow, as well as these other texts. And I just wanted to let you know that we are going to be looking at the reign of Ra through these two texts. I will, of course, put the relevant passages on the screen. But if any of you are interested in downloading the entire text and reading it uh, yourself, I've made them available online. So please feel free to download and read them or bring them. You can bring them along and follow along and contradict me and tell me how I'm wrong <laughs> when, we go, when we go over certain passages. And yeah, so that's it for now. And I'm happy to take questions. Yes? To be hard to hear because it's not a we come to all this information if there was never any recorded writing. Oh, there was recorded writing. There was. Yes, absolutely. Sorry if I wasn't there. I'm, I don't want to leave that. Yet. And there was. Yeah, oh, for sure. So the um, writing came um, about in Egypt at the end of the fourth millennium. This is hieroglyphics. Yes, okay. but not just hieroglyphics. Um, there's other writing systems as well that evolved out of hieroglyphics. Um, but yeah, they, were, um, they wrote a lot of stuff down. They just didn't have a tradition of narrative prose in the same way that the Greeks did. And they do eventually, but it just they weren't as interested in like a lot of extended narrative descriptions. Um, at least what, what survives are, are religious texts like hymns, right? Uh, hymns and prayers, spells and that kind of stuff. But we'll you'll see tomorrow. But there is a problem, you know, I mean I'm sure as most of you know, the Egyptian language uh, Ancient Egyptian language died, I mean, it, it disappeared. Knowledge of it disappeared. Uh, and it was only reconstructed in the last couple of centuries. So our knowledge of ancient Egyptian is somewhat still imperfect. And often the texts that we find, these papyri, are fragmentary. So if you download those two texts, you'll find that some parts of them maybe don't make so much sense. <laughs> and part of that is because either the text is broken, um, there, there's a space missing in the manuscript, or it's also just because our knowledge of the ancient Egyptian language is somewhat incomplete. Um, so there's some ambiguities or uncertainties. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Uh, I saw there was reference to a phoenix in one of the texts. Is that a concept that the Egyptians had, like the firebird? Because I thought that was more of an Eastern. Um, good question. I'm trying to think. Yes, they definitely have the concept. I don't know. It's not, a, it's not very prominent. One, I don't think, but it might be in a different tradition. I'm honestly not sure. But I'll, um, I'll look it up and get back to you tomorrow. But I think you're right, it's not as common as in the Near East. Hmm. Other questions? Yes, the people uh, worship these various gods. That's a good question. What, is it, what does that word mean, worship? <laughs> what is it to worship something? Um, to love? To be devoted to? Um, I don't know. I don't know if we can talk about the Egyptians loving their gods per se. Um, they definitely interacted with them. They definitely were accessible. There are tons of images of them uh, with the right prayers and incantations and uh, dedications. Um, you know, you could hope to get favor from the gods. Uh, so they, they coexist in the same world, right? Um, that said, not, it's a hard way, well, it gets complicated, but, um, so take example, for example, cult statues. They had cult statues for the gods. And these cult statues were often in temples uh, and then attended to by priests. But there's a hierarchy of priests. 
So higher ranking priests had better access than lower ranking priests. But there's still ways for everyday ordinary Egyptians to interact with the divine. You can just go to a divine place and pray to the god uh, and interact with them. Now, is that worship? I'm not sure. What, what do you guys think? Tell me, what do you think? What do you, how do you think? What does worship mean? As someone who studied religious studies, worship usually relates to a physical act involving ritual. Myths, rituals, and symbols form the three parts of religion. So something that involves ritual behavior, ritual acts, and the use of symbols, whether it's physical symbols, written symbols, painted symbols, that tends to form worship, which involves reverence and often the reenacting of a mythological story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's how you define worship, and absolutely, <laughs> Egyptians definitely worshipped uh, the gods, and, um, for sure. But the but I want to I, but I only make one, one, make one distinction is that the relationship between the Egyptians and the gods are is a bit different than say, the relationship between say Christians and Jesus Christ. Because it's a different type of relationship. Um, and it's not really about say like belief, right? So if you ask the Egyptians that they believe in the gods, they probably wouldn't really understand that question. The gods just are, right? And you have to deal with them. <laughs> um, you know, you don't want to anger them, and they might interfere in your life, and they so they're there. Yes. The common people get the same sort of afterlife as the king, because it's only the kings who get into the afterlife. So what happened with their graveyards of the common people? Um, well, everyone has the potential is to go into the afterlife, uh, at least according, as far as we can tell, say, when we, we have lots of information, so like the New Kingdom or the Middle Kingdom. Um, and, and especially in the New Kingdom, the way to get to the afterlife seems to be more about how you behaved on this on this earth. Did you live according to mom? Did you live according to the correct cosmic order? Or, you know, were you a chaos monkey? Did you try to disrupt the order? Um, so if you behaved in the right way, then in theory you could. Now, some people believe that it was easier to get to the afterlife if you had lots of spells and lots of things to take with you and you'd have a better afterlife. But there's some contradiction in the sources about this and some debates uh, that you know, that, that all, all the stuff that kings took with them to the afterlife was meaningless. So even in Egypt, there was a debate about this. But in theory, yes, everyone can go to the, to the afterlife. But um, in terms of preparing burials, obviously there's a huge variation in terms of the wealth of the burials, from really lavish ones to very, very basic ones. Um, an important part of the afterlife, they believe in surviving in the afterlife, of course, is continual sustenance. So that's where magical spells and also ancestor worship comes in, right? So um, one of the reasons that people created these lavish tombs with magical spells and, and all of these things is that they didn't have maybe insurance, let's put it that way, insurance that your ancestors aren't going to come and do rituals to make sure that you're okay in the afterlife. Uh, and so, you know, if you're not, if you don't trust your, um, sorry, not your ancestors, your descendants, I'm sorry. Uh, so if you don't trust that your descendants are going to come to your grave and bring you food and drink and do the prayers, well, then you can just carve it on the wall, right? And it'll be activated magically. Um, but, I mean, that's answer your question, there's a lot of variation in belief about this and a lot of different ways that they dealt with it. But in theory, yes, anyone could go. So we did the Greeks and the uh, Egyptian civilization that you were talking about, we did it cease to exist? Well, it depends on how you, you know, identify or define what Egyptian civilization. You know, I mean, why, did it, why did it stop in you know, like a huge gap now to the 20th century? Or the oh, there's, well, there's, there's no gap, really. Um, what happens is that, um, I mean, the Egyptians are still there, right? They're in Egypt. You can go see them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they're descendants. Um, but they don't worship these gods anymore, right? Today, they are mostly, uh, they mostly adhere to Islam. Um, before Islam, so Islam came along in the 7th century. Uh, but before that, not all at once, but eventually it, um, they converted. But before that, of course, Christianity. So Christianity is largely responsible for the death of traditional Egyptian beliefs. It doesn't mean the Egyptians left. They were still there. They just became Christians. Um, it took a while, you know, a few